Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? We're back with another episode of Career Bound, and today we're going to shake things up a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about you know what we're currently reading. Thought it'd be a fun episode just to uh, take a break from some of the breakdowns we've been doing and uh, talk talk a little bit more about some of the things we're uh, reading, some of the interesting ideas we're you know digging into outside of the day to day grind. So, John, I want to set it up first to you. Um, grab one of the books. I know you're reading several, but grab one of the books that you're reading first and we'll, we'll kind of talk through it, see if there's any interesting nuggets we want to uh, take from that book. And we'll just kind of go back and forth on some of the different things we're currently reading. All right. Well, I'm going to start it off with like kind of a funny one, I guess, but uh, recently, recently read Connor Boyack's The Law in the Tuttle Twin series. So obviously a children's book. Um, but based on <laughs> based on, based on um, the law by Frederick Bastiat, uh, it was cool. I mean, I read it with I read it with my wife and our now nine month old. So it was kind of like just like he doesn't understand much. It's not like he's really <laughs> he's not really like following along. He's nine months old, um, but it's fun to read it with him. It was just it was. Uh, I think what I appreciated about this because this was. I had really just been introduced to the Tuttle Twins, and what I appreciate about it is kind of like, even as an adult, like putting some of these more, not necessarily complex, but like real, like grand scheme ideas into very tangible and understandable uh, writing styles. So like a kid, a kid can read this, and it's written well. It's got it's got cool art. Um, basically, though, like what I took away was like the idea in here I, I don't want to go through the whole plot of the book but there's an idea in here basically where it's like they go to their neighbor and the kid the kids go to their neighbor um because they have to go to somebody with wisdom and and he ends up explaining the law to them he goes through this book and but where they land is they talk about his tomatoes like he's got like a they have their whole nut tomatoes here and then he's got like he grows tomatoes in his garden and he, he gives them a jar of tomatoes and but he's talking about how it's really great to be able to do that on your own fruition, out of the goodness of your own heart, or out of, you, you know, you decide you want to, you want to give, you want to help people, uh, versus being regulated or mandated or giving it to the government as a middleman to, to share to everybody. So it's introducing some kind of like economic and political ideas um, in a very basic form. But I thought he, the way they wrote this, um, articulated it well, and it made it, made it cool to hear. So I don't know. I mean, that's just like, we just read it with my kid and like I'm not like deeply studying it, but have you, have you uh, read any of their stuff? Oh yeah. I've read, I've read quite a few of the Tuttle twins books. I highly recommend for uh, parents, especially parents with kids that are a little bit older. I mean, read them at any age. They're fun. They have some, uh, they have some board books too that are, you know, probably a little bit more age appropriate for younger children where there's like a, they have a, Alphabet Sedarian book. So it's like the, uh, I think it's like Liberty, the ABCs of Liberty or something like that. Uh, they, they have a ton of them, but the, the law is a great primer. I think that was one of the, the, the first ones they wrote. They have another one that's called The Creature of Jekyll Island. So that's, that's a great one about the, how the Federal Reserve, which is, yeah. you know, kind of pulled from the, the actual book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which that's a trip. Um, if you ever have, you know, like 20 hours to, to read that dense book, but, um, the law is a fun one. So I, I'm thinking more about the original, like from Frederick Bastiat. So fun fact, that, that was one of those, I like to call them gateway books for me. Uh, but I remember reading Frederick Bastiat for the very first time. I remember exactly where I was when I read it for the first time. And I had this like, this like uh, pamphlet version, like this, this very like, uh, like, it, it's in the public domain and somebody had reprinted on Amazon like that really loose leaf. It was really poorly made, but it was like this, this big. Um, and I remember reading that it was, I think my senior year of college. And this is where I was really digging my heels in the ideas of like, um, freedom, economics, political philosophy. I was doing a lot of soul searching, trying to kind of, um, build a better framework for the way that I thought about the world and the way that I um, kind of thought about 
you know, my, my role as a human being and citizen in the world and, and society and like the government's role and all these things, you know, like that, I think that's, that's a perfect time in your life to, to really start digging those in. If you don't, if you don't start doing it at a much younger age, which is, you know, great use for the Tuttle Twins, but uh, the law, one of my, one of my kind of favorite premises from that book is kind of this, this loose, highly recommend, we'll link to it in the show notes, um, ways that you can access it. But one of, one of the kind of foundational ideas from that book is this idea that like life, liberty, property, none of those exist because there are laws. Like they exist because, you know, like, I mean, if you're, if you're religious, those are, those are natural rights endowed by our creator. Like there, there's sort of this, this foundational layer of, of natural rights that supersede the existence of the government or supersede the existence of laws. And there are these, these natural rights that are sort of the foundation of, of a good, healthy, moral society. And laws have come about as a way to protect and preserve those things not as the source of those things. And so I highly recommend that book as, you know, whether you're, you know, immediately aligned with that phrase or, or kind of that idea or not, or you're just, you know, curious about deepening your, um, deepening your inquiry into political philosophy, moral philosophy, economics in general. Um, but that, that was one of those gateway books that I read that and I was like, all of this resonates with, all of this resonates with my worldview and I hadn't articulated that. And it's funny because it's a book that was written like hundreds of years ago and yeah. I, di I didn't read it until, you know, I was in my mid twenties. This book had been around for a long time and it's like, man, I wish I would have had a book like this even earlier. Uh, but I've always kind of found like sometimes, sometimes the best books are the ones that find you at the right time when you need it. But that, mm. that book was a foundational one for me that sent me down a rabbit trail. Um, so I don't know any other nuggets from that. that you, yeah. I mean, you some, some of what you just said, some, some of what you just said made me think of it. Like, obviously this itself isn't an old book, but it's built around an old one that you're just talking about. And I, yeah. I found that I found that I've started to really enjoy maybe more now than ever reading older books, whether it's novels or just, or, you know, economic theory or political theory or just like why people were thinking about the things they were understanding like what those things were what mattered in different times because i think it's i think it's become very important to me to understand the roots of things and not just like like the roots of world systems but like okay but like what did people care about and the people that built the system the systems that i live in today why did they do it what were they what were they facing um so i've just found like it's it's been really insightful and honestly i'd be curious to hear if this has been your experience but i found that a lot of the things that people run into today or problems that people have today they're not entirely different than pro like there's not a lot of new problems they're just they just have different like they just they're different like they have different subjects like there are, they surround different things, but at the core of a lot of the problems we face is people, whether that's just like as individuals or like a people as a whole, like they're very similar. So I've just, it's really just a thought that like, I've, I've found it insightful to like, listen and read what people were facing hundreds of years ago, a hundred years ago and see how it parallels to today. Yeah. I mean, the, the context may seem like it's changed in many cases, like the problems we're dealing with today may seem like they're somewhat different, but I, I think reading older books like that, especially the timeless ones, the ones that, you know, the, the, the ideas are still at the core of like the things people are struggling with today. I think one of the refreshing things is like, one of the refreshing things is like, I'm not the first one to feel this way. That's one of the, like the, the simplest observations I, I've had from reading, yeah. you know, older liter literature, let alone like, you know, nonfiction, political philosophy, moral philosophy, uh, even, even, you know, books on spirituality, faith, the Bible, and, you know, um, commentaries on that. But um, one of the other things is, this is maybe a, a, a more pessimistic, dismal view of it, but sometimes I, I read books like that. And I'm like, wow, we really haven't come very far. <laughs> you know, like, we're, we're still, yeah. you know, we're still, we're still as a species. Um, 
you know, culturally, like wrestling with so many of the same ideas. But I do think that that kind of kind of reinforces the ideas that like, hey, these are the these are important ideas. These are things that we're still we still haven't figured out culturally speaking. Like these are the the the, the problems that um these are problems that are still very prevalent in our life. Like the idea of you know your your right to your own property, your your right to your own life, your 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 right to um, engage with others in a peaceful, mutually beneficial way without any type of government interference. Um, anyway, so that's a great one. And actually, it actually sets up well for, you know, one of the, I'll, I'll go through, uh, you know, I'll pick one from my list here. So uh, I've been reading back through a ton of sort of the classics. And when I say classics, like the classics in that, in that domain of political, political uh, philosophy, moral philosophy, economics um i've been reading i've been really enjoying so it's called uh the fugitive essays by frank chodorov um frank is phenomenal writer he's 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 you know one of my one of my i guess literary literary intellectual heroes um a lot of his writings sort of center on that friction between man the individual and sort of the state like the 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 um the friction between, you know, an enterprising person who, who just like, they, they want to prosper. They have goals, they have ambitions, they have dreams, they have, you know, this desire to provide for them themselves and build a life and the friction of, of like government interference and imposition that sort of stands in their way. And so he, he has a lot of different writings on, on different things. I, I highly recommend them. Um, Fugitive Essays is a great one. He has a great memoir. Um, I, I believe it's, I believe that his memoir is called uh, One is a Crowd, which I, I think is phenomenal. He also has another book called um, Out of Step. Both of them are great books. Um, those were early primers for me as I was going down this rabbit trail, you know, a dozen years ago or so, um, really introducing myself to, to different frameworks and different ideas. But um Frank was really good friends with a guy named Albert J. Nock. So also brilliant essayist. Um, and this is another thing, as I've been reading Frank Chodorov's books, he and Albert J. Nock both wrote a lot about education, which is highly relevant to the world we live in today. There's, there's tons of debate and um, different points of view about education and the government's role in education and parents' rights to educate their children the way that they want and and like all of the sort of nuance about that discussion uh, behind the scenes so i've been enjoying in particular a lot of the essays from both of them about uh, education the the sort of state apparatus in education as it exists today and some of the ideas that they put forth about ways that you know maybe we can move toward a more um a more amicable approach to respecting parents' rights to educate their children. And I think we're seeing a lot of the, the, the reason that's really, I mean, it feels almost prescient that, that some of these things were written in like 1940s and 1950s, reading through some of these. Um, but it's, again, it's that reminder of like, hey, we haven't come that far in like 70 or 80 years. A lot yeah. of these ideas were things that, that were at the forefront of sort of the political conversation 70, 80 years ago. Um, and there's still, I, I would say, if anything, they've gained a lot of traction. There's a lot of stuff about school choice and vouchers and how to design a better system for giving parents and families the flexibility to choose how to educate their system in spite of the way it's been done, where, you know, basically people's tax dollars whether it's property tax or sales tax or some combination are, are going to fund public schools. And if a parent doesn't want to send their kids there, you know, they're already paying the taxes in many cases um, that go to fund those public school system, uh, those public school systems. And so a, a, a big conflict that I know a lot of parents have is, is the affordability and the, the uh, like if I, if I want an alternative, to public school, like what are my choices? I know a little, for for a lot of parents, it's it's the affordability factor, or it's the yeah. idea of like we have two working spouses, and we would have to give up an income to do that. 
um, if we wanted to homeschool or, you know, if we wanted to pursue a private school, we definitely need both of those incomes in many cases because private schools are more expensive. And so it almost feels like there's kind of this conflict that I know a lot of parents go through, you know, and I'm, I'm a new parent, but our kid's not quite there yet. But this is something that we're already thinking about is there's this conflict of, hey, we have to make these trade offs if we want to try and educate our kid the way that we want to, to educate them. We either have to take a financial hit, you know, give up, uh, give up an income and homeschool, um, you know, pros and cons to that probably beyond the extent, you know, beyond the, the focus of this, this episode, but, um, or we need to keep those incomes to be able to afford this private school. And that private school may be better, but it's maybe not everything that I want. And so anyway, what's funny about this book, Fugitive Essays, there's a lot of essays about education and, and that per those particular problems, Albert J. Nock has, has several as well, is they're kind of laying the groundwork for what we're seeing happen in, in the world of school choice different voucher systems, different, you know, tax credit systems, all those things about basically how can we empower parents to have that choice and remove the sort of pressure of state interference on, on families decision to educate their kids and, and bring them up in the values that are important to them. So that's something I highly recommend. Yeah. Even if you don't read the whole book, there's some great essays in, in fugitive essays about um, education, school choice. Um, Albert J. Nock has some other, uh, other good ones as well. So that's, that's been a, something I've really been enjoying lately. When you kind of talk about, um, how it's like, man, like we really haven't come too far. It's so true. And it can be so dif like discouraging, but I think there's also a level of on the flip side, the optimistic side is like, okay, like, some of these these problems are still prevalent, but people have been thinking about them for a long time. So there's got to be people who had the right idea that that shared the right idea that maybe I can go learn from. And that's like where I find like if you're like trying to find the, you know, you're trying to harvest some gold from it. It's like okay, like somebody who who somebody thoughtfully put this together and offered solutions, and maybe mm -hmm. maybe now I can I can. And this is like a theoretical I, but I being the person who wants to put these ideals forward can use what they created as kind of a framework and now hopefully implement that, um, whether that be through a network or, or if we're talking about kind of like educational an education system and, you know, educating, giving, making sure parents have the, the right to educate their kids the way that they see fit. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know. I'm, I'm encouraged by that because I, I didn't bring this book down. Um, but one of my favorite sales books is, is called how I raised myself from failure to success in selling by, Frank Betger, it may be Betcher. I don't know how to pronounce it actually. Um, but it's not a very long book. But what's cool about it is that it's a sales book that was written in the, I think he sold in like the 20s when, when he was really like at the peak of his selling career. Maybe after, maybe it was, and, and it may have been after World War II. And it was either before or after. Um, but what's cool about it is like he's not talking, he's not writing about here's all the tech tools you should use. Here's all the, um, here's the email sequence. Here, here's the email sequences that you should be writing. Um, here's how you should use LinkedIn and email and a, a power dialer. And I'm not knocking tech tools; they're great, they're super impactful. But what I mean is, like, what's cool? What I took, what I really got got from that book was like, here's a guy who understands selling because he just understands people, and he's just learning how to like work and connect with people the right way. And that's super valuable because that's always going to be there. And I think it will stand the test of time and always prevail because tech tools come and go. Um, they have, they, there's, there's churn on, on tech, there's churn on new fads, but if you can use something that's been tried or that's been tested in the past and it's kind of, it's going to withstand the test of time. Um, I, I thought that was really cool. So it's kind of a similar theme um, is like looking back to older work in order to understand the, kind of the core values without seeing it through the modern lens. I know that's like a little bit of, a little bit of that was jargon, but, no, but it's it's, it's good because I think like similarly as I'm reading some of these things, what's nice is it seems that there is a tendency. I know I'm guilty of this too, but it, it seems that there's a tendency when we encounter problems in the world, you know, whether it's something we're dealing with personally or like on a societal level, there's this, you know, problem that's causing conflict that people disagree about. And we've got you know, some politician with a platform saying, hey, here's how we're going to solve this. 
But I think there's this tendency to approach problems as novel problems. They're brand new problems. They're unique to us. They've never been experienced before. And so those novel problems require novel solutions rather than like when you, when you read more broadly, especially um, you read across different eras and you read this, this older stuff and you, you begin to recognize so many of these problems have been going on for such a long time. And so many people have written about them and they've, they've documented their ideas and they, 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 in many cases, they put forth, forth ideas and whether those ideas were right or wrong. One of the things that I think is the net benefit to us that as modern, you know, as modern man with all our tech tools and um, whatnot, we, we seem to think that we've got to start over from scratch approaching new problems. But there's this great foundation of so many people who've written awesome things and they've studied some of these problems for for decades and decades. And even if it did happen in a different time era, there are all these different iterations of ideas that are really useful for us to understand and then use as a basis for then approaching problems that we're, we're still encountering today, rather than thinking, oh, we got to sit down and we got to come up with a novel solution. It's, it's better yeah. to be you know, my, my opinion is it's better to just be exposed to, Hey, what, what have people tried in the past? Or what were some of the ideas that ha people have, uh, you know, for, for decades, if not centuries, what are some of the ways different people in different eras thought about these problems? And what are some of the different things that they tried? What are some of the things that they tried and did not work? Why did they not work? What are some of the things they tried that, that seemed to work? What are some of the ideas that never got implemented that seemed that they ha held promise? Let's go back and, and reflect on some of those before we sit down and form a committee and try and approach a problem um, with this idea that we have to come up with a novel solution. You know, there's the, thing, there's the saying, like, no, there's nothing new under the sun. And in many cases, I think so many of the problems that we deal with on a daily basis, we would be yeah. better suited to reflect on other people's experiences. And I mean this both at, you know, like on the macroeconomic level, but more, more importantly, I care about this much more on a much deeper level when it comes to like my own life, my own personal life, my, the, 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 the sphere of influence I have, or like, what are, what are some of the things other people learned from their experiences that are relevant to me as I'm facing sort of the, the normal day-to-day -day challenges that I encounter. And, um, that, that's one of those things like it's so much better and more profitable to learn from other people's mistakes or yeah. from other people's successes than trying to, then trying to solve every problem in your life as if it's a brand new problem that no one has ever encountered and is totally unique to you. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I, I love about learning and reading so much is there are all these people that have told their stories um, and, and they've shared some of the things they've gone through. And, you know, it's, I don't, I don't know, that's one of the things that I think is most enriching about reading and why I would recommend it to anybody is like, there's literally answers to most of the tests hidden in, in great books. Yeah. So like take, yeah. take advantage of them. In many cases, it's cheaper than, you know, trying to, fit, trying to solve a lot of problems your, yourself and like bearing the consequences of them. A lot of times, you know, yeah. uh, a lot of times spending 10, 15 bucks on a book, you get one really good idea out of it. You're going to have incredible ROI in your life. Um, yeah. because somebody else documented that problem that they were dealing with and they gave you an answer key. Well, speaking of documenting problems that you're dealing with, this is like an interesting take on this. But um, I actually, I actually opened up what I read this morning from from the Bible. I was I was in the Psalms this morning, and I was reading Psalm 103, and I just wanted to read the beginning of it because I think it's kind of like an interesting. Yeah, it's go like for a, it. it's like an interesting. I'll just I'll read it and then I'll say what I think is interesting about it. So it's just it's Psalm 103. So yeah, it's Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. And it goes on. But basically what I want to highlight from it is, so as a Christian, somebody reads the Bible, and I think sometimes like, it can be easy to go through the motions reading the Bible. And it can be easy to go, to go through the motions reading anything. But I think the context of the Psalm of David that's so important is that like he's writing that from a place where like he's, and in a lot of despair, like he's running from intense persecution. Like somebody's literally trying to kill him. Yep. Someone who, someone who he loves, 
and cares about and has been who's been in like family right so what i think is what i think is cool about that is when you read really read it he's saying he's speaking to his soul it's a poem to his soul like it basically like why why are you so much in despair like he's almost like reminding himself like yes this thing is happening yes you're being you're being chased down in this way but you don't have anything to like you don't forget the goodness of god in your life don't forget this blessing and this benefit and i just bring that up because i think it's even though really what i want to get at is like the way that we read like you have you should we should just be intentional about the way that we read and be open to like how we're reading it like you could just read that and be like oh that's a classic phrase in the psalms bless the lord of my soul but then you're like no but what does that really mean like what is he getting at where is he writing that from like what is he going through and it's like yeah it's such an uplifting thing because in your life when you're dealing with i mean hopefully you're not dealing with somebody like coming after you trying to kill you like that's probably less common but like when you're dealing with the the battles of life and and the spiritual battles that you're going through like that's something you could like declare to yourself over your life bless the lord so i don't mean to like hijack the podcast today and preach but i just wanted to share that because it's kind of like i think it's there's a lot to learn about reading even just from reading the bible and like understanding the context of the things that are written there yeah totally and i think you know one of the things i like about what you just said is is understanding the context behind a specific piece of text um, and it's it's not always as easy like when you're reading the bible there's all these brilliant commentaries and it's not always the case for a lot of books there's not like all these other commentaries that set the stage for hey this this guy wrote this piece here's what was going on in his life here's what was going on in the political climate yeah. here's here's what inspired this and that's that's why i like memoir so much is a lot of times they put it into context at least of somebody's personal experience if not like the historical context but i also love like when i read a book um I like to go down the rabbit trail of like what else was happening. I like I like to go s- search those things out because it's it's like a I don't know it's kind of like a choose your own adventure game. But I do think it's 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 really useful. And what you just said, um, it, it made me think of is the the verse in Philippians uh, where it's like whatever is good, whatever is honorable, whatever is true. Mm-hmm. Like meditate on these things. These things. I think that's a, a yeah. Like meditate on these things, and I think that that's. That's one of the things that's one of the added benefits or, or, or sort of features of, of reading, I think, is like surround yourself with good ideas, surround yourself with things that sort of redirect you to the truth, surround yourself with ideas that 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 fix your eyes on the horizon, you know, to be a little bit fluffy there. But like a lot of times, you know, so, you know, the, the Psalms um, and I think there are many other even non-biblical books like. Uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius's uh, Meditations is another good example of this from the Stoics is, is all these brilliant people, these historical figures who went through, you know, they're major, major figures and they kept these journals and they wrote down the things that they're struggling with or they wrote down their observations or they wrote down. And what I find fascinating, but also sometimes humbling about that is they used that. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I'm going to write this because I'm I'm creating something that I expect other people to consume. I'm writing yeah. something that is deeply personal, and I'm writing it because I'm struggling with this thing, and I don't have the answer. And my tendency is to do something stupid or bad or you know totally human and react in a negative way. And so I'm I'm meditating on this good idea. I'm writing down what I think and know I should do, and what I think is is the right course of action, even though. The second I get done writing this and I get up, I'm going to still have all the natural human impulses. <laughs> like, this is what I'm going to put in my mind. This is what I'm yeah. going to focus on. I think that's, that's, that's something powerful. You know, I think it's, you know, obviously a great benefit of reading, but also on re- writing, meditating. And who knows if you, if you become prolific at doing that, maybe your, your, your writing is the one that, you know, 50 to 100 years from now, somebody's sitting down and they're reading and it's yeah. giving them encouragement. Yeah. But, um, I'm going to, par- I'm going to parlay from what you said, um, to one of the other pieces that I've been reading. So this is an essay. It is by Albert J. Knock, who I mentioned earlier. It's called Isaiah's Job. One of my all time favorite essays, um, especially with the work that we do at Praxis and, and sort of the things that I, 
you know, the, the gifts and skills that I like to use, which is like, you know, writing and helping other people and communicating. And it's, it's um, Isaiah's job, which we'll link in the show notes. Basically, Albert J. Nock is talking about how he has this friend who's this brilliant intellectual. And he told him, you know, I want to take my work to the masses, basically. I want to go educate the masses with all my great ideas. And he's like, why would you want to do that? That's the worst possible job. Um, he's like, the masses don't have any respect for actual substance. The masses don't care. The masses is like, better yet, you should focus on writing the best, truest stuff that you can. And he talks about um, the way that he kind of parlays this into like Isaiah's job is he talks about Isaiah um, and it goes down like, um, you know, if, if you're not well versed on biblical history. So there's this period of prosperity in, in Israel after this king, King Uzziah's reign, uh, he reigns for like 50 plus years. And it's basically a prosperous, peaceful time. And near the end of his reign, and then immediately after he dies, just calamity strikes. Everything, you know, society's on the decline, like all sorts of stuff is going haywire. And God calls Isaiah and basically tells him like, your job is to nurture the remnant. Your job is to go and preach the truth. And it's to mm -hmm. do it, even though people are gonna hate you for it, nobody's gonna listen to you and it's not gonna do any good. Your job is just to keep doing it. And he's like, well, that sounds like kind of a terrible proposition. Like, you know, like, you know, like I'm, uh, I'm going to go and, and, and do what I think is right. Yeah. But people are going to hate me. I'm going to be cast out. My life may even be in danger and what it's not even going to do any good. And, and, and God's kind of, you know, consoling him, encouraging him. He said, what you don't know is there is a remnant there. There is a group of people. You don't know how many they are. You don't know where they are. You don't even know that they're going to be listening. You don't know how your work is going to find them or the message you're preaching is going to find them. But it is, it's giving them encouragement. It's bringing strength to them. And that's your job. Your job is to, to preach to the remnant, to write for the remnant. And Albert J. Nock is telling this to his friend. It's like, what better job could you hope for? That you are staying true to what you, you know, what you believe. You're, you're seeking the truth. You are unadulterating your content um, and, and your work quality, you know, you're not trying to gain a claim. You're trying to do the best possible, you know, best possible uh, work that you can that, you know, write the truest possible thing that you can, even though most people aren't going to listen. But he, he tells, uh, he, he, he says, there's, there's kind of two things. There's only two things you'll ever know about the remnant. First, it's that they exist. And second, they will find you. You'll never know how many they are, where they are, what they're doing, what their movements are. But he said, they're out there and they will find you. They will find your work if you keep doing it. You keep doing the best version of yourself. And so I've always taken that passage as, you know, and, and, and the you know, sort of the, the story of Isaiah in the background is based on is, is as extreme encouragement, especially, you know, sometimes when you're like, you feel like the world is going crazy and you see something that yeah. seems like an absolute obvious, like, no, this is the way that it is. Why is everybody being crazy? And you've got to just kind of stand firm on your own feet and know that, you know, there are other people out there who also appreciate and admire the truth and want the truth. And, and, you know, this is, this is obviously being a little bit philosophical, but I think that it's a good way to, it's a good piece of encouragement um, to keep in mind, regardless what your line of work is you know, as you navigate through life and feel like maybe you're living in a political, a time of political hostility to what you believe. Like there are other people out there. There's a remnant out there. Your job is to nurture the remnant. Your job is to continue to seek truth and do the best. So yeah. anyway, that's a phenomenal essay. I've reread it, I don't know, 20 plus times over the years. And I was just rereading it the other day as I was digging back through some of Frank and, and Albert J. Knox work. And Highly recommend it. It's a great one. Yeah, this took a cool turn. I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting us to like. I'm enjoying this. Um, I had a. I had a thought that was more. Um, it's it's less about specifically what we're talking about. It's actually something you and I were talking about the other day. Um, 
and it's kind of like like when we talk about the idea of censorship or terms like misinformation or disinformation and it's like yep i think it's much better to let ideas stand for them like just let them be and and they will either prove themselves for lack of better terms good or bad right so i guess like mm -hmm. what do you think about that or i think what we're what we're the books we're talking about or just books in general it's kind of like we should just take the ideas in right and like don't don't force don't do stuff you hate. Like, don't force yourself. Like, if you're like, I hate reading this. I don't want to read this. Like, don't force yourself to take the idea and don't continue through it. Um, but it's good to it's good to ingest it and be able to and be able to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna analyze this and why why might why might a particular idea that this group is saying, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. Like, well, I'm gonna go read the idea instead of instead of hearing it through the lens of just people that are saying it's bad because I don't know that they all they've all read it. They haven't given me a thorough explanation, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go understand what this idea is, and that's kind of like that's one of the things too that I enjoy about reading the some of the older books that I've been reading or the older writings is that well a lot of people have had a lot of opinions about things that have been written a long time ago because there's been a lot of time for opinions to be formed, but I can't truly understand their opinion unless I know I know the subject matter. Um, so I just think it's really important to go and like read things firsthand, like even. Even stuff that you think you're probably going to disagree with, like even stuff that you're like, well, I'm I don't fully understand that position, but I think I disagree. Like I definitely disagree with it now. I think I still will, because it's probably better to. And this is where I'll, I'll turn it over to you as a question. Like, would you agree, and or would you add anything to this? Wouldn't it Would it not be better to go read something that you think you disagree with, to either a see that oh I actually don't disagree with this, or b see. Well, here's why I disagree with it. Like now, I'm understanding why I, why I don't agree with 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 this idea or with this philosophy. Yeah, you you brought up a handful of different things I want to bring about. So, you know, first and foremost, you said something about like don't continue to read a book once beyond its usefulness. So, like I I think that you know when I was as a much younger person and especially kind of coming out of the academic mindset, there was this I don't know I felt this false sense of obligation to finish every book that I read. And it actually ended up kind of diminishing my, my quality of life, my enjoyment from reading. Uh, it also contributed to me reading a lot less. And once I started having a better relationship with books and I, and I also kind of played itself out in this weird way. Like I treated books really sacredly. Like I wouldn't, and I, to some sense, some sense I still do. Like I wouldn't dog ear pages. I wouldn't take notes in the margin. I wouldn't like, I would preserve these books as these precious things, but they're tools. And I think fixing that relationship, I, 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 I rekindle my love for, for learning and, and rekindle my love for reading. And now like I take notes all over the books. I dog ear pages. I like add notes to the margin. I, you know, have tons of tabs in some books and, um, you know, I, I beat my books up, you know, because I'm, I'm just soaking up everything I can out of them. Um, and books that I don't enjoy, like, I don't know if, if I get, it, it varies based on the type of book, but like sometimes it's 10 pages. Sometimes it's a couple pages. Sometimes it's 30 or 40 pages. Sometimes I'll like, if I'm really in, interested in the idea, I'll force myself to get like 50 to hundred pages in before I toss it to the side if I'm no longer interested. But for the most part, I don't feel this false obligation to continue to saturate myself with an idea that I'm not either enjoying an idea that I, I feel is no longer useful or an idea that I feel like it's being belabored where it's like, all right, I got the substance in the introduction, you know, and, I, and that, that wasn't a waste of money. Maybe I got one good idea out of the first 30 pages and I could toss it aside, or maybe I yeah. truly just didn't enjoy it and I can move on. But to your other point, the reason I think that's a better approach to reading better relationship with your, your, yourself and learning is what's the point in the first place? You just talked about how you should let the best ideas stand. And for me, learning is an end unto itself. It's something that brings about mental, physical, spiritual well-being for me. I, I truly enjoy it. I'm happier when I'm reading on a regular basis. I get dopamine and serotonin bursts from that. That sort of, you know, has all sorts of biological benefits, I'm sure. But more than that, it it makes me more creative. It makes me more engaged. It makes me just you know, it, it, it kind of keeps me in a good headspace to be more effective in my life. 
but the actual content and substance of what I'm getting, the way that I see books and learning in general, it's about iterating with ideas to increase my ability over time to get the results I want out of life. And that's where this, yeah. this kind of core belief I have about like letting good ideas speak for themselves, stand on their own legs and, you know, bad ideas are going to play out. Bad ideas are going to play out in that the stated benefits of an idea do not lead to the actual benefits or the actual outcomes. Good ideas, you know, truthful ideas, ideas that are in harmony with the natural order of things tend to have a fixed relationship between sort of cause and effect. And I know this is, this is getting kind of like meta, if you will, but, it, but it, it really is. There are actual, you know, actual things here. So we'll use personal finances and exists. I don't, I, I have a few personal finance books here on my, on my shelf, but, or on my stack that I was, I, we may or may not get to here, but a good example is, you know, I'm just going to bring it up. One of them is, is called how, how you can profit from the coming De devaluations by Harry Brown, love Harry Brown, um, highly recommend checking out of it, out his work, but Harry Brown wrote this book in 1970 and he's, he's basically saying, I don't see any way with the rate that the United States and the federal reserve is inflating the currency and you know, some of the spending that's going on, I don't see any way that they can continue to keep the gold standard. I'm basically predicting that within the next couple of years, or at least in my lifetime, the United States is going to remove the gold standard. Okay. This is kind of a heady, boring thing, unless you're really into this like me and really geeky into this. But what he lays out is here's a potential, um, a potential risk that I see, um, you know, both for myself and he's a financial manager or financial planner. So he's kind of also got clients affairs that he's thinking about, but he said, here's a consequence of this bad idea played out in the real world. And here are some of the things that I think I'm going to do based on my understanding of the world and the natural laws of economics. Here's what I think the consequences of that are going to be. And so here's what I'm going to do instead. If these are the consequences, of this bad idea played out, here are some of the things that I think make natural, obvious sense for me to do with my money instead. Okay. So he writes this book, 1970. Within a year, the United States, Richard Nixon signs this into law. They, they, they remove the gold standard, which, you know, basically they, they say they're going to stop redeeming gold um, at the, the market rate of $35 per ounce, which is what they, they've done. And if you now zoom out, having we got 54 years of, of financial data. Uh, based on that played out. And I've actually got another book. Uh, it's called The Permanent Portfolio. This is uh, this is a breakdown of Harry Brown's actual investing strategy. And they've pulled data from like the 70s all the way forward. I think it was written in like 2012 or something like that. And they show the returns of some of the things he suggested compared to sort of the, the, normal, the normal way that, you know, the normal recommended way to invest your money. And the returns are phenomenal. And he wasn't even laying out this strategy of like, hey, you're gonna just crush the, the market average. He said, this is going to be, this is a strategy that's going to win no matter what's happening in the world. Anyway, use that as an example, because when I'm talking about, it sounds like what we were talking about is kind of heady and meta that was like, you yeah. know, you're, you're engaging with, books or ideas as a way to improve your ability to generate the results you want out of life. And this is a specific actionable example of not just a book that was sort of laying out in groundwork, but it's also a 50, 50 year review of that idea yeah. played out and, and the consequences of, of this idea applied to a specific, you know, a specific problem, which is, you know, in a world of economic uncertainty, I want to make sure that my money continues to grow continues to be a good hedge against in inflation. Um, it, it provides me a good buffer against taxes and it allows me to afford the lifestyle that I want over time. And he literally puts forward an idea. He puts his money where his mouth is and his ideas turn out to prove true. I think that's as, as good of an example 
you know, off the cuff as I can, I can, I can lay out of like, that's the real benefit of ideas. That's a real benefit of reading is finding ideas and iterating with those ideas to, you know, to attack the problems that you have in your life. And over time, hopefully you get better and better and better at, um, selecting and implementing the ideas that actually help you get what you want out of life. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I didn't, I actually didn't know about that. So he, he predicted it like a couple of years ahead of time that they were, that they would remove the gold standard. I think it, it was like w within a year or something like that. And, and, you know, I think if that's all the context you have, you're kind of like, wow, this guy prophetic. And so I've gone back and I've been kind of reading, you know, some of the other, other, yeah. other kind of contextual, contextual, um, contextual and relevant information. Like here's, here's kind of what's going on in, in the background. And it's, it, you now realize like in that era, in the late sixties, in the early seventies, it was one of those things that it wasn't quite as prophetic. It wasn't things that like wall street was saying, or like the, you know, you'd hear from political pundits saying like, Hey, we're going to remove the gold standard. But if you kind of zoomed out and, and saw what was happening, it was like, this is, this is a natural consequence of the things yeah. that are happening. It's like, this is an inevitable thing. I'm not even making a bold prophetic um, prediction about something that, that may, it's not like the, 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 the people who are like, uh, you need to pay me $100 per month or you need to pay me $10,000 because the rapture's coming and I'm going to watch your pets after it happens. Like, it's not like that type of prediction. Like we, you see that kind of crazy stuff pop up every, yeah. every, you know, every so often there's somebody that, that needs headlines because they're making this bold, crazy prediction it is, you know, arguably whether it's crazy or not, but like something that, that there isn't all of this like perfect kind of contextual data that, that, sort of supports this is a natural conclusion of this. This is one of the things where it's like the government continues to spend money. There, there's no way that they can continue to do this while yeah. being attached to the gold standard. So anyway, um, it, it was one that I think was a countercultural idea at the time. And so that's why even 50 years, you know, have passed since this book is written. And it seems like this really bold prophetic thing, but it's more understanding the historical context is it's kind of like, this is a guy who wasn't worried about what was popular or what was culturally approved or the like, you know, yeah. politically approved talking points. He was zooming out and he was, he was thinking about what was happening and he was thinking about, okay, what does this mean for me on a personal level? You know, if the, if the government continues to spend money like this, um, even if they keep the gold standard, what is that going to be mean for my personal portfolio? Okay. If they detach from it, what are, what are the things that I can do? What are the things that I can do regardless of what other people do, regardless of what, you know, political forces do? What are the things that I can do to make sure that I have a solid bedrock financially? Yeah. That's, that's why I love Harry Brown's work is sort of all of his work is sort of that ethos of like, what are the things that I can do practically so that I can continue to live free. I can continue to be prosperous. I can continue to design my life the way that I want, regardless of what's happening outside of me and what other people are doing outside of my control. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really interesting. You said something else. I just want to touch on this when you were talking about like, not how far you get into the books or like, um, not feeling pressure to like just finish for the sake of finishing it. And I think it, it's something I just was, I was thinking about, when it comes to that is like there can probably be a tendency or somebody who maybe let's say like is like stuck in that and they're interested in and in maybe removing that because they feel like it's holding them back in like, like removing the idea that they need to just like finish everything they're starting just for the sake of finishing it um because i think people can feel like you know like it's it's inherent it's just like automatically wrong to not finish something you started but i would counter that to say but just by saying simply it's not and the reason is if you're not obligated to anybody else or you have no like moral or legal or um just like ethical obligation to complete something like especially when it comes to a book like if you just started a book on your own you don't have any obligation to finish it no one's gonna no one's gonna come after you if you don't finish it nothing really bad's gonna happen to you if you don't finish it and it's kind of like understand it's a little bit freeing just to be like okay like if there's no if i have no obligation to do this i'm only doing this by my own choice and if it doesn't, if it doesn't seem like something I, that jives with like where I'm at right now, like I'm not enjoying it, 
I don't have any motivation to continue in it. It's totally okay to not do it. And I, I know that that's kind of like redundant what I just said, but I just wanted to say it as like a specific encouragement to anybody who like might listen to this. And it's like, yeah, but like, how can I actually do that? Like, if you're not obligated to do it, like, you really don't have to. And it's totally okay. Like, you can always go back to it. And it's, it's kind of silly, like, like I said, redundant, but I just wanted to share that, put that out there. Well, it's a silly mental block in the first place. And I say that having, you know, being a rehabilitated book finisher, you know, somebody who felt just like I, I was obligated to finish books, but here's one of the things that I, I helped. So I think there is sort of this dopamine rush of, of being able to start a book and finish it and tell yourself, Hey, I'm somebody who finishes things that I start. Like it's this, it's this sort of like psychological sure. reinforcement thing at play. Um, there's also probably the social status of you can tell other people, Hey, I, you know, I've read X many books and I finished this many books. Like there's all, all sorts of, you know, sort of <laughs> status games going on with that. But one of the things that I've got is I feel like is the best of both worlds. And it kind of plays a trick on myself is I stop counting books that I finished. I stop logging. Here's all the books I read, or here's how many pages I read. I just don't care about that stuff anymore. What I did start doing though, um, you know, quite a few years ago, I, I, I don't even know. I have a spreadsheet that I, I tracked this on, but I started logging all the books that I, I start. And the way that I track the spreadsheet is I, I add a book anytime I buy a book and I, I put that and I, I log typically whether it's the first time I read it or if I'm reading it again. Um, and I've got this sort of running list of books that I've started and, and most of them I don't even finish. I finish a ton of books, especially the ones that really grip me. But a lot of times the, what I've really benefited from this is I get the little psychological, you know, dopamine hit of like, Hey, I've read this many books or I've interacted, engaged with this many books. But, the thing that I've really appreciated, especially over time, is I can go back and I can kind of like map my intellectual journey. One of the things that I yeah. really love about um, about this is even the books that I don't finish that I start, a lot of times those books give me gifts. Sometimes it's an idea. Sometimes it is a recommendation or recommendations of other books or other people who influence their idea. And now I yeah. can go find that person's book and I can read that. And maybe that one's a little bit more engaging and gripping to me. Um, but I've, I've got this, this log running and it's fun because, you know, especially when I'm thinking about my journals or I'm you know, doing self-reflection, I can kind of go back and I can look through, Hey, here's some of the ideas that I was, uh, I was interested in. Or um, sometimes when I'm working with somebody specifically on, on something, um, you know, let's just say like, I'm working with somebody who wants to build copywriting skills and I'm giving them recommendations. You know, I can give them advice from my years of experience and, you know, all of the books I've read and all of the, the work I've done, all the sort of mastery I've developed over the years. What I can also do though, is I can kind of go back through my log and I'm like, here's the journey I took, you know, here, yeah, here are the books good. I read in the order that I read them in. And, and I can kind of put myself back in that time and place before I began to develop mastery on that particular thing. And that's been a really helpful thing. In, in helping other people kind of build their own journeys, their own learning journeys. Um, but really it's most useful just you know, on a personal level because I can kind of, I can log the way, the way that I kind of navigated through a particular yeah. topic. Um, and sometimes it's good because you'll look back and be like, Oh, I forgot about that book. I need to pick that one back up. It was so, it was so good. I'm going to read that again. So. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember the first time I discovered your, uh, your, like year in review book list. I enjoyed, I enjoyed looking through your spreadsheet. I think you put in like a blog post or something in like 2021. Um, and you reviewed, you reviewed all of them, which was cool to, which was cool to see. I I always thought it was a cool concept to like have it all that, have that out there too. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, let's land the plane there. Um, that's, that's a lot of content. We didn't have a game plan for how we're going to go this. I think we had some good conversation. Hopefully uh, this was fruitful for you. If you're listening, um, Hopefully you enjoyed. Thanks. Thanks for bearing with us here. And uh, as, as always, for listening to the podcast, if you have suggestions about future topics, questions that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, drop them in the comments or send us an email playbook at Discover Praxis. And we will be back again with another episode soon. Do you want